What's up, YouTube? It's your boy Skinny Moose. Boy Fast Squirrel. It's your boy Brian White. Suicidal Beast Brian Woods. <laughs> All right, let's kick it off. What made you want to become a, or a wrestler? Not a decimal wrestler, but a wrestler. Man, I, I grew up on it. It was something that I've always felt, you know, that drive and energy for. Um, I mean, I can pretty much say anybody and everybody I've been around wrestling-wise, we've all kind of came up a lot of the same way as far as enjoying that atmosphere. So it just kind of felt natural to me. I understand that. I understand that. I grew up on wrestling. I mean, I'd done some stupid stuff when I was younger, but never really decided to actually push it into a career or a lifestyle. So I just left it at that, you know, little teenagers fucking around in the backyard and not right. even really True. just jumping around, beating the shit out of each other, getting bloody. But other than that, I just left it at that. Did you always want to be a deathmatch wrestler? Was that your first career go? Or career uh, absolutely, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, at a young age, I started to experience a lot of issues, whether it be physical or mental, and uh, dealing with that physical pain, it just, it was really overwhelming, so I enjoyed the wrestling and everything else, and I wasn't quite sure how I felt about the deathmatch wrestling. For a long time, I was real hesitant about it, and uh, yeah, that's, long story short, that's when I ended up running into Spider Boudreaux. And, uh, yeah, we became tag team partners, uh, best friends as close as brothers. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, here I am. I just kind of fell into it, and I realized it felt great to me. I loved it. You and Spider had some good good matches against each other, too, especially um, Cup. Yeah, Lord knows I got enough concussions from that tough son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, between you and Spider, when you when y'all two come at somebody, you know that you're gonna get an ass beat. That's best way to put it. Between if, and if it's both of y'all, then you might as well just run out of the ring or fucking go get your plane ticket across country or some shit. I mean, your life's dead. You got you who really don't feel pain, gives no shits. And then you got Spider, who's the same way. So, I mean, Spider got stabbed in his arm by John Rare, and, like, he's, do it. Just don't hit my tattoo. And I'm like, you just give this man permission to do something like that. So, <laughs> how many surgeries have you had? Uh, shit, you're going to put me on the spot like that. Let me see. Uh, I have <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten, eleven, thirteen. Jesus. Plus thirteen. Mm. Uh, the most, uh, the most major ones is I have a total hip replacement, a total knee replacement. My foot is completely fused together, and then I've had to have uh, my tendons in my hand completely repaired twice. Jesus. So when you had all your your you know, getting your foot views together and all that. How long was you down and out for? Uh, like my foot fusion, I was out for uh, probably about nine, ten weeks just on general of the recovery. And I was back in the ring within about four months. Jesus. So, I mean, I, I literally had a hip replacement and eight months later I was, uh, up in uh, North Carolina doing a tag team deathmatch tournament. This man does not feel pain. This is what I'm saying. Oh, I feel pain. It's not that I when? don't feel pain. It's when? just my body doesn't register pain the same way as most. Okay, so when, all right, that, 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 here's my question. You know, I'm just speaking to you in general. You come off a of freaking U-Haul. You mess up your L1, L2 vertebrae. Is that correct? Yeah, fracture both didn't, of them. You didn't realize you had done it the whole time you were up on the hill. I knew you were hurting because you were laying on the ground and just chilling there for a minute. And that's when Blaine comes up with the infamous photo we have. But <laughs> you didn't even res you didn't even realize just how bad how you were. Bad. Really. People walk around like, walk it, around like it. Yeah, it didn't really hit me until the next day. Uh, 
when I literally, once the swelling and everything had kicked in, I couldn't even stand up straight. And I knew something was something was off. So that's when we left and went to the ER. So I don't have it written down, but what you say in that, if you didn't have to go to the hospital the next day, would you have been in um, Kings of the Carnage? Yes, I would have been defending my title the very next day. I... It would have been him and Chewy. Oh, shit. Damn. Yeah, we missed out on, the on that one. I think that the world was cheated out of that one, but we will have it eventually. I know we will. I'm looking forward to it, but, you know, that just goes to show that the fortitude, the, the strength of this man. I mean, like, he gave it all he had until he just absolutely couldn't take no more. It takes a lot to make Bryant Wood say, I'm not going to do it or I can't do it. Because Kane is not even in his vocabulary. So uh, I'll tell you what, if, if you go back and watch the video, you can see for a moment the refs were checking on me. I, I, I really, I couldn't even move like my feet or nothing for a minute. I couldn't budge. And uh, finally, like once I realized I, I could start moving a little bit, all I could do was just crawl over to, to pin little sicko because I, I couldn't hardly stand up. I had to have help standing up. But uh well, I got a question about that match, too. Um, if you want, go back and watch the pay-per-view, which is still on streamxpw.com, guys, if you want to check it out, you see a point in the match where you appear to pin him, and you're like, fuck no, fuck no, keep going. Yeah. You said, Can you tell us more about that? All right. So a lot of people out there don't know this, but me and Lil Sicko have a long-time history. Uh, his father... Sicko Senior was another one of my real close friends, you know, veteran worker with Spider, you know, uh, somebody that I really looked up to. And me and him had some just off the wall, crazy ass matches. Unfortunately, they never got to be recorded for like IWA or anything like that. But the man was absolutely an amazing worker. Um, so pretty much like little Sicko was always like a nephew basically to me and Spider and several of the other guys coming up, even with guys like Blaine. And, uh, you know, we know how tough he is. We know what he's capable of. And one of the first things that was said to me when he was a kid was he came up to me at Carnage Cup 8 after my match with Spider and I got thrown off the top of the first U-Haul through the Spider Net uh, death contraption. And uh, he told his dad, he said that uh, whenever he got into the business, he, when he got into death matches, he wanted, he initially said he wanted his first match to be against me. Well, that didn't happen, but his father literally looked at him and he looked at me and uh, he basically said, Brian, I want you to make me a promise. He said, if he wants to bring himself into this, you know how bad it sucks. I don't want him to come in half ass it. You make him earn it the right way. And uh, him to just lay down and take a pen after that, that just sent me fuming because I know he's more than that. The kid's yeah. absolutely, he's an amazing talent. He really is. And I have no problems putting him over. And he's tough as hell. Yeah. But, I mean, he, he kind of laid down on me. And I, I found that very disrespectful. So, I restarted the match, and I was going to make him, you know, push through it. Whether I ragdolled his ass from that point forward and he had nothing left in him, I wasn't going to let him just lay down and quit on me. So, But he didn't. He didn't. I, mean, I understand that. He did at first. I mean, I got him pinned off of uh, off of the initial slam, and I, yeah. I wasn't going to accept it. So uh, he actually talked to me later on he, and flat out told me, like, after, like, the first headbutt, when we was on the ground, it was, like, lights out from there on. So, Dude, yeah, you had the most hardest headbutts in the game. Harder than Necros. Oh, shit. Legit. Damn. Go ahead, guys. So, yeah, you can see if you watch it back, uh, him and Tulo Sicko was going at it. And uh, he goes to pin him, and then, like, he pins him, and he gets he gets pissed the fuck off, and he leans down, and his hair's all on his face and everything, and he just fucking set, tells that referee, no, 
and he flips the fuck out. Next thing you know, he's slinging little sicko around, takes him up on top of the U-Haul, and completely demolishes the man. But speaking about the IWA Deep South title, uh, Peter B. Beautiful decided to say that he didn't lose the belt. Hold on. I will have to actually find this so I don't miss it. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he, he's basically saying that he never lost the title and he don't understand how you're champion. I mean, I don't know. I mean, he's I just know. He a, a quick match to get some notoriety against the Beast or whatever, but, I mean, he's had his ass handed him plenty of time. Here you go. Go ahead. Wait, I am not the IWA Deep South champion anymore. I never lost it. Your thoughts, Brent? Feel free. Bring your ass down here and let's see who's the toughest they got. I promise you I'll leave you spilling blood while I sit there and laugh over you. Well, look, the title, it is what it is. You know, Kevin, it's his tournament. It's IWA Deep South's Carnage Cup. If he wants to make it, you know, where the the tournament champion takes the title, it is what it is. You ain't got to lose the title. You wasn't there. That just I mean, means I ain't that seen him. And it, you wasn't there to try to keep it. So if I take it out from under you, it is what it is. I mean, if you're going to hold that title, you should know every time that promotion's running, you should be one of the main men to know everything about that that promotion and that promoter because you're holding his belt. You're holding his money. But also, in the long run, he's holding your money. Right. So you, you should be more focused in and then when – Somebody wins the belt, and you go October, December, January, February, almost into March without saying anything, and then you have to bring it up in a group? Like, why yeah. not go in front of Kevin or Bryant Woods himself and, you know, my title. I want my title. I want to fight for it. But, I mean, you just can't say something almost five, six months later. It makes you right. look bad. Do you think that reason most men don't call you out, is it a healthy fear or is it a healthy respect they have for you? Honestly, I don't care which one it is. Fear is fear. I mean, the ones that they know they got the balls to step to me, we've been in the ring already. We've earned each other's respect. That ain't an issue. But if you ain't got the balls to call me out and step to me face to face, that's your problem, not mine. I know what I'm capable of. Whether or not you think you're capable enough to get in the ring with me, that's your call. I respect that. I know I'm not. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what what is your worst injury or major ones you've had in your wrestling career? Uh, let's see. The worst injury I would definitely say was me fracturing my back. Um. Uh, and I say that because it, it wasn't so much as, you know, I didn't have to have surgery or anything like that. The doctors actually uh, billed me a clean bill of health after about nine weeks. Um, I'm still real sore and everything. But for the first, like, three or four weeks, I couldn't stand up. Like, I could not stand up straight. It hurt. Uh, like, I can I can truly say, like, I it kind of scared me. It wasn't you know, the pain or anything, it just kind of scared me, you know, am I going to recover to a point where I can actually do what I want to do? Uh, it was just that fearful of the unknown at that point. But if you want to go as far as saying the most painful injury, uh, so there's a, there's some clips on uh, YouTube and you can actually find the video. Me and Masada uh, up at IWA Mid-South had a match and uh, it was me, Masada, and Ricky Shane Page. And uh, it was a 4th of July death match. And uh, I took a power bomb from Masada off the top rope into a burning charcoal pit. Well, the pit had been lit before the show even started. So it was just red hot smoldering coals. And uh, instantly, as soon as my back touched it, it melted into my flesh. Like... Uh, I had second and third degree burns across 17% of my body. Jesus. And that was the absolute most painful thing I've ever done. Like 
recovery wise, that was straight. But for about a week straight, I mean, I couldn't, I literally couldn't stand the thought of putting a t-shirt on. I had to go see a skin specialist. They had to give me special creams and stuff. And I can't even go without a shirt now out in the sun. If I get a sunburn on my back, it feels like somebody just took a torch and lit me on fire. Like it's, it's badly messed up the nerves in my back. Did you have to get skin draft from that? No, I didn't get skin grafts. Uh, I've got a lot of blotchy areas on my back, but I didn't have to have skin graft. Um, actually, I asked Masada about when you and him went at it, uh, King of the Death Matches, and you punched him. I said, did he mess up your jaw? And he said, yeah, you fractured it. And um, I was watching your TikTok last night about you making the, the muscle milk, and I looked at my wife, and I was like, look how big his fucking hands are. I said, his hands are humongous. He has to wear at least a size 18 ring. She said, his fucking <laughs> But we, this, this, the camera, the pictures do not serve no justice. Anybody's watching this, if you ever meet Bryant Woods in person, you're going to know you are around the beast. I mean, he is, I, I don't know, an ominous force, like I say. I mean, I stand by that. He's the biggest worker that I have ever been around in my life. When I met him at Violet Shit Cup, I was more starstruck than anything at first when I seen him. And it took me a few minutes. He was talking, I think, I think you were talking to Chris Claus and them or whatever. And I was like, uh, uh, Mr. Woods, and he says, Brian, I said, can, can I get your autograph and a picture? And he's like, well, I'll get you a picture. Because I guess I was being too much of a mark. I don't know. But I got that picture with him, and you see the picture of me beside him, and I'm scared to death the whole time, and you got this massive man standing next to me. And I mean, I've been around some big guys in this business, but when I stood next to him, I knew I was standing next to a fucking man, because I'm just like, how's the weather up there? You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. That, that's me. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically what it was. That's how I felt when I was standing next to Brian. Go ahead, Squirrel. Have you ever or would you wrestle internationally? Uh, I've had offers for that. You know, it's been brought up several times. Uh, I would enjoy it. I just, for a long time, it's kind of been one of those situations where, uh, you know, a lot of times with going international, you know, you got to be planning for something to be away for, you know, uh, a week at a time, if not longer, and it's kind of put me in a bind because I'm a single father with three kids, you know, and throughout my career, you know, that's one thing I refuse to do. If you've seen the documentary, you know, I grew up, I never had a dad, and my mom died at a young age, so uh, for me, me being a father comes first no matter what, so if that means I got to sacrifice some of my career goals, you know, it is what it is, but uh, if the right time and right opportunity pops its, you know, pops its way up, I, I mean, I have no problems with it. You know, uh, it's been brought to my attention about going to Mexico several times, going to Japan and everything else. Uh, I know at one point in time, there was a guy from Germany that was trying to get me and Masada together uh, to go to Germany. And he just never could come up with the money. So, uh, but I mean, hell, I always thought that'd been cool as shit. You know, he, he was booking it, you know, the idea of potentially either me versus Masada again or potentially us doing like some tag team work. I mean, I thought that was going to be a fucking blast, but the guy never could come off the rock money for us. I understand that. Yeah, I watched your documentary and, um, like you said, at a young age, just by the time you was like 21, you've lost just about everybody. And like, that's fucking mind blowing. And I'm like, I told Brian, I was like, I ain't even fucking tw seven minutes in this documentary and it's done. Blew my fucking mind. I'm like, dude, I did not know that this, you know, this is what I was expecting to watch. Then I watched the whole thing and I was like, it explains a lot about you and, I, I, I like it a lot. Well, when you see that documentary, you see more than just the beast Bryant Woods. You get to meet who he is outside the business, shoot yeah. style. You're, you're getting to know the you get to know more about him than than most people do, you know. And I think that was that was pretty courageous of you, dude. You you brought out a lot of deep dark things there a few times. You brought out a lot of things that that most people would just be with any normal person would fold under that kind of pressure or or the things you've been through and you just thrived it seemed like the more that 
the good Lord threw you away. You just kept thriving and kept thriving and kept thriving. And, and for me, it was inspirational. It lets me know that, that nothing, and I mean nothing, is impossible. Not a damn thing. So for me, personally, the documentary inspired me more. I mean, you're not the only one. I've had a lot of people over the years reach out to me and tell me, you know, how watching my documentary and stuff, it it kind of, you know, helped them bring to life some of the issues they were dealing with at a young age and was able to face a lot of that. And, uh, you know, when they initially came to me about the documentary idea, you know, it was the same concept they wanted to do with everybody else, you know. Uh, where you grew up, how you lived, you know, how you got into wrestling, so on and so forth. And I, I constantly, everybody always, anytime I done interviews, they always want to ask, you know, what made me become this character, you know, the suicidal beast. And uh, I always, uh, I had started developing this, this atmosphere of calling everything just another day and another scar. And I told him, I said, I don't want this documentary to be like anything else. I want it to be, what it is to be who I am, you know, it, how did I become this person? This is why, you know, and when you're put in that situation, you're forced to deal with these things day in and day out, you know, living in, you know, physical and mental pain every day, man, the minor shit going out there and just taking on some of the, the outside mess that don't mean much of nothing. It don't affect me. So I'm able to endure that much more. And I, I just, I thrive on taking as much as I can just to be able to come back and say, yeah, you give me all you got. Now watch what I'm about to do kind of situation. <laughs> That's, I, I, I've seen that before in him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, this question was wrote because I actually thought that you hurt your, messed up your hip at Carnage. How many hip surgeries have you had all together? I've had four hip surgeries all together, the last one being a total hip replacement. Jesus. Oh. And that puts you out, what, eight months of the ring? Uh, yeah, I, I was out in general uh, for about six weeks, and then at six weeks the doctor told me that I could start driving and stuff and going to physical therapy, and – I never went to physical therapy the first day. I went straight to the gym, and for the next six weeks, I lived in the gym working out for six, seven hours a day until I went back to my shoot work, and then I continued to push on that, and then eight months later, I'm in North Carolina doing moonsaults off the top rope. Shit. Can you imagine something that big, doing a moonsault, and you're just laying on the ground, all you see is this big, big, guy coming down you're like this is gonna hurt <laughs> yeah that's gonna that's gonna hurt that's gonna hurt i mean yeah. like instantly you think that your world's gonna be over because i mean you know you're laying there and you're gonna think and then all of a sudden you see brown woods big ass flying across Bruh, the ring no no if you don't want to answer this you don't have well, how much do you weigh uh currently right now i weigh 309 is that mu that that's got to be muscle that's your muscle, yeah. I, I got how much percent body fat do you have? Uh, last time I checked, I was at 12 and a half. God, so you, you so again, y'all imagine that 309 pounds of pure muscle doing a moonsault coming down. I mean, <laughs> wow, that, I gotta that, take this. that makes I gotta my take stomach this. turn just thinking about that just now. Ooh. Whoa. Hmm. World. That's got to be the biggest man that I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> Go ahead, Squirrel. I noticed you have a lot of ink and piercing. What is your most painful or unique body modification you currently experience? <laughs> I watched that the other night, too, and I showed my lady because she's, like, a big fan of you. And I'm like, that, that, I don't know if I can get past this first part. Absolutely. Just when, like, after it got hit, you know, like, after it was done, I was like, <laughs> Dude, I watched that, y'all. I watched a lot of sick shit in my life. Okay? Uh, I, I grew up on bestdoor.com <laughs> shit, you know. But this right here, that, oh, oh God, just, uh, 
I mean, I'm sure the ladies appreciate it, but it was just. <laughs> Oh, fuck. There's a difference between leaking across the top and leaking all the way around it. Hush, bro. bro. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to. I, I like the idea, but I don't think I'm going to get past the. the I, 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 maybe getting a Prince Albert, but. Splitting the tongue? Yeah, yeah, no. No. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it, 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 as far as pain-wise, honestly, having my tongue split wasn't that bad. Uh, it is one of my favorite modifications. Uh, the most painful, though, I'll honestly say, was when they were doing the lime work on my sternum. Uh, so far, that was that was pretty gnarly, just... I wasn't expecting it the way it was. I mean, I was literally, I, I had my entire rib cage blasted for eight and eight and a half hours and I was asleep, like drooling. And so, I mean, and then I got my sternum and it, it, it kind of made me wake up a little bit. <laughs> it, I may be wrong, but at one time, didn't you have your nipples pierced? A uh, long time ago, but it didn't last all too long. Yeah, I thought he was wrestling one time. I could have sworn I seen him with a nipple piercing one time when he was wrestling. <laughs> I had to ask that because I was like, I know that he had a piercing like that one time. <laughs> I, so, I, kinda, I, I took mine out because, like, number one, working out and everything else, like, it kept I, I was raw all the time, and it just really irritated, so I eventually took them out. And it was it was funny because I took them out, and probably eight months later, I was working at one of the little local indie shows. And uh, one of the guys I was working with, I can't even remember his name, you know, he was just kind of local guy or whatever. And uh, he took his shirt off, and he decided he wanted to start swapping chops. And I was like, all right. so. Uh, I chopped him, and when I did, he was pouring blood. I, I ended up, I chopped him across his nipple, and his nipple ring got ripped clean the fuck out. He was just, like, laying on the ground screaming because I accidentally chopped his nipple ring out. Oh, that's great. So, no, he was a nipple ring that day. So, I did see you when you faced Spider, and I did watch you when you faced John. But have you always been like a, a monster? Uh, I've always been a pretty big guy. Um, there for a long time, I kind of wasn't so much worried about working out and everything after I initially messed up my hips. So I'd just gotten big. Uh, at my heaviest, I was at 360 pounds, but it was not muscle. Um, after my daughter was born, it kind of woke me up a little bit. And uh, I immediately started training, dropping weight and everything else. And that's why I initially met Spider because he was trying to do the same. So we just kind of connected. But uh, I've always been really big. You know, I graduated high school. I was already six foot four and I'm six, six currently. Um, but I've always fluctuated uh, ever since I even dropped all the initial weight somewhere around like 260, 270. And then I got into the strongman aspect and just continuously driving to push heavier and heavier and heavier. Next thing you know, I started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And now it's kind of overtook. So I understand that. My goal, my current goal, though, is I want to get up to 325 pounds, staying at my current body fat. That's manageable for you. That's very manageable, easily manageable for you. <laughs> Well, I'm taking in roughly about nine to ten thousand calories a day. So, holy shit! Well, so all right, all right. Give us a day. All right, your daily meal. What does your daily meal snacks consist of? Uh, all right. So breakfast. Normally, I'll fix up 
Like if I'm by myself now, if I've got my kids and stuff, it's a lot more. But for myself, I normally open one of the small cans of biscuits and I'll cook up a whole thing of biscuits. I'll cook up about half a pack of bacon, about a, a half a dozen eggs. And then normally I'll end up adding syrup or something on top of it. And I, that'll be like my breakfast. And then uh, from there, I end up going in later in the day. Uh, through like I do still have a shoot job and everything so like I, I make my own snacks so like I've got like honey peanut butter crackers uh, that I make myself that are just loaded down with peanut butter uh, I've got an unhealthy obsession with peanut butter by the way <laughs> um, so I'll snack on that and I'll have like a protein shake and then for lunch normally I'll have a, a big container of rice or some kind of wheat noodles or something uh, loaded down with uh, anywhere from about 12 to 18 ounces of some kind of meat, whether it be chicken, beef, steak, you know, anything. And uh, then, of course, you know, I'll snack on whatever throughout the day. I mean, like, for instance, it's nothing for me. I'll sit down and eat a whole ass pack of Little Debbie Donuts as a snack. <laughs> Like, I, I consume and consume and consume as much as I possibly can. Uh, because if I don't, I literally feel like if I miss one meal, I feel like I ain't eaten in two or three days. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so, uh, since, you, since you hardly feel pain, when do you feel like you need to stop in a, a, a match? Never. When the pen happens, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> well, that's a simple answer. Uh, no, I, I'll tell you what. The only time, <laughs> th this is the only time I've ever stopped a match early. Uh, me and Nick Gage up at IWA Mid South. Uh, the whole spot was I was supposed to have took a back body drop over Nick through a barbed wire and contraption that was made it had like two by fours wrapped around it and kind of like nick couldn't quite get me up all the way and the way i fell my ribs landed on the two by four mm. and i snapped the two by four in half and then slammed to the pavement um mm. i ended up i had three broke ribs and two that was dislocated and i could not breathe like, I wasn't sure if I punctured a lung or what, but I could not breathe. I've had broke ribs before, but nothing quite like that. And uh, I, I literally, like, I couldn't breathe at all. And I, I told the ref, I said, we're going to have to finish this quick. And I still took Nick's finish, and that just killed me worse because it was that damn knee breaker. And I just laid there, like, gasping because I, I had nothing. Like, I couldn't function. It took everything I had just to be able to walk to the back, and then, oh, it was miserable. But that's the only time. I mean, uh, Spider fail. We was in a match uh, one time, and that's how it initially messed up my foot. Was me and Spider was in a match, and in a Russian leg sweep, he ended up like. I don't know if it was quite how he fell, but he landed on the back of my heel, and it broke my foot in four places. And Damn. I finished that match, turned around, wrestled another match about 45 minutes later and everything. Like, it wasn't until the next day I woke up and I went to stand up, and I was just like, oh, uh, my foot's fucked. <laughs> So I went to the hospital and they were like, yeah, your foot is fucked. Like, and then I got put in the damn cast and boot and all that shit for about eight weeks. Well, that's another time you got your ass off. What advice would you give to an up and comer breaking into the deathmatch scene? Uh, fuck. That's a good question. Don't hold back. If that's what you want, don't hold back. If you pussy foot around that bullshit, you're gonna only hurt yourself or your opponent. That's if you if you decide you want to do something, you just better fucking take it because if you half ass it, you're gonna get yourself really fucked up. That's the first thing Brian ever. I asked him for just any advice in the world, and he said he said, "Well, when I watched your match, 
you kind of pussyfooted with that barbed wire when you got slung into it. He said, you pussyfooted. He said, you might as well take it full fledged. I said, well, what if I fall and hit that, hit that ground and break my neck? He said, well, that's a risk you're going to have to take. It's deathmatch wrestling. He says, take it all. So when you, and he's right. I've noticed in previous death matches I watched over the years when he said this to me and I started paying more attention to it, when they hesitate, they get fucked up. Good example, Jimmy Chondo over at HTO. When he well, got Shane home, Mercer. How in the fuck would you grab the top rope on your way over when he had you cleared? He had you cleared. I don't understand that this day, but that's just a good point. A good point I'm bringing up with that. That's a good example of it. Don't half-ass it. Just take it. It's going to hurt. Hey, it ain't well, that I, I can't express it enough, and I actually caught a whole lot of hell over an incident that was similar. Uh, God rest his soul, you know, Colt 45, you know, me and him, we – had great matches together. I love yeah. the kid. He he was an amazing talent as well. And uh, we was up in North Carolina working a show, and the spot was he was supposed to took my finish, the mark of the beast, off my shoulders, and we were going to sit out through a car hood. And whenever I had a shirt on at the time, so I had him in the torture rack across my shoulders. When I went to spin him forward, he freaked out and he grabbed my shirt. And so when he grabbed my shirt, it started coming up and pulling me forward. Well, at that point, the only thing I could think of is we're going to crash straight to the pavement. He's going to land on his head and I'm going to land on top of him. I'm going to break his neck and kill him. Yeah. Like, it, like immediately. And my only reaction I could do when I felt him pulling me was I just squatted as far as I could and just praised him out, and he just took a flat back bump to the pavement. Uh, he did catch the back of his head on the edge of the uh, car hood, but he, he even flat out said to everybody, you know, he didn't even feel his head hit that. And he knew, you know, what happened. He he flat out, he came to the back like I was, I was worried to death about him, you know, and he was like, Brian, that was all on me, brother. He was like, I freaked out. I was not used to being picked up like that. And, he, you know, it just it scared him. It spooked him. And uh, had I not had a shirt on, it would have probably been a different story. He wouldn't have had nothing to grab. But he freaked out in that moment, and accidents happen. you know. I, I did. I caught a lot of hell over that. People wanted to give me shit like I didn't know how to work. And I was like, no. I was doing what I could to protect him to keep it, you know, keep him from ending up with a broke neck. I know, understand I, that. And, and if if a move don't go perfect, and a wrestler and another wrestler sets up something like Murdoch, you know, but when Murdoch accidentally broke that guy's neck, you know, the guy even admits that he pulled out. He's the one that broke his own neck. And Murdoch still gets shit on for it. Yeah. But it, it was a fucked up move. I mean, he's hit this move multiple, multiple times. And that's what, you know, y'all are getting at. When, like you just said, go through with it because how, how was Murdoch supposed to know that this guy was going to pussyfoot out? Or how was he supposed to know? I love Coke 45. He's one of my, you know, favorite younger deathmatch wrestlers. But how was he supposed to know Coke was going to do that? Y'all don't know what's going through that opponent's mind, so you must as well just do it and go through with it. I mean, well, botches happen all the time. They happen all the time in the ring with us, but it, it's determined. That really shows how good of a work you are if people can catch it. Um, yeah. I've asked Brian a few times. Like, when I watched Met Cup, uh, I was talking to Sick on him. I was like, how you feel about it, man? You know, he's like, well, I feel like I've done this and I've done that. I said, you, you blew what? When did you botch this? You know, and, I mean, a good worker can cover up a botch and you never knew it happened. And yeah. I... I'm not just saying it's because you're on the program. I'm not saying it at all or because I know you personally, Bryant. But Bryant has never had a match where I've seen him botch. Just saying. I botched plenty of spots, I promise you. But we never noticed it. That's what I'm saying. That's yeah. what separates the good workers from the bad workers, in my opinion. Maybe I cup, and that was one of his older cup videos. But... <laughs> Or maybe off stream because he said that he's done a lot of matches that ain't been recorded. But like you said, it's hard to notice it. So right. with that being, being said, how many bones have you broke? Oh, oh. Well, not, not all wrestling related, but 
I'm going to guesstimate probably somewhere around like the 50 to 60 range. Because I know like I've broke every one of my fingers and toes. I've broke both my wrists, uh, one of them twice. I broke my collarbone, my shoulder blade, uh, my knee, my back, uh, my hip. Uh, and, and a lot of those I fractured more than one time or broke more than one time. Uh, I've broke my left ankle twice. I broke three or four bones in that foot alone, uh, broke bones in my right foot. I mean, I couldn't, and there's no telling. I mean, I, I would probably guesstimate around like the 60-ish range with how many times I broke bones, uh, not just once, but twice or three times. Is Mick Foley your dad down the line somewhere? Because you know. <laughs> Terry Funk, <laughs> Terry Funk, Dusty hey, Rose. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, even if I cut, uh, Abdullah the Butcher's married into the family, you know, maybe we got Bruiser Brody <laughs> in the bloodline here. Definitely got that in him. He's definitely got that in him. You can I mean, see that when he squares like up to somebody. When he squares up in the ring with somebody, you see a lot of Bruiser Brody come out. Like, no back down. You're going to fucking hit me whether you want to or not. You're going to hit me because I'm going to make you hit me. And if you don't, it's going to be worse on you. I mean, that, I see a lot of Brody. That was a very good comparison right there. I see a lot of that. I mean, maybe Slack's his brother, you know, don't take no offense, please, but, like, you know, it, it, have you ever fought Slack? Yes, yes, yeah. never mind, don't ask that, that, me, that. Me and Slack have had some, uh, we've I've had, we've that, had a couple, in our, and, you know, we've had a couple run-ins in the ring and stuff like that, and, uh, you know, that was something I kind of brought up to Kevin that I wouldn't mind to see now. You know, he's the current XPW champion, and with us being on the XPW pay-per-view, I'm now the current IWA Deep South champion. I mean, Slack, anytime you're ready, brother, you know I'll throw down with you any given day of the week. You choose the match, so let's put it together. Rob Black, yes. y'all watch me. He just Book fucking called Slack out. Book it. Shut up and take my fucking money. Book yes, it. yes, fuck yes. It don't matter where the fuck it's at. Yeah. Well, if he, with them reason for Bryant, but yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Would you do a belt for belt? Hey, if both promotions are up for it, let's fucking put it on the line. Oh! <clears throat> so with that being said, if you, if you was to win XVW belt, would you work for Rob Black? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. That's, that's the goal, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I've had a couple guys that I, I've worked with in the past that are currently working with XPW, and they've all brought it to my attention, but it just hasn't been brought up straight to me by Rob or, you know, his management team. So, I mean, that's that's about where it lies. But, I mean, if Rob hit me up and he wanted to get something together, hell, I'll show up. We'll put it, you know, put it in the books. Mm, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fuck, oh, we need to fucking get a hold of Rob Black. <laughs> All in due time. Go ahead, Squirrel. I noticed you've been in a lot of tournaments. What is your favorite deathmatch tournament to be in? Oh. Let's see. <laughs> I'll be honest, man, like, my my favorite tournament that I was in was initially the, uh, uh, the first GCW tournament of survival. You know, uh, Zandig, you know, he reached out to me personally and uh, asked me to come in. And, uh, man, I had a fucking blast at that tournament, man. It, it was literally me and, you know, some of the biggest names uh, on the planet currently, you know. Uh, and we went out there and we just went to war, you know. And it ended up being, uh, guys, you know, the finals, you know, it was uh, me, John Wayne Murdoch, Marcus Crane, and Danny Havoc. I mean, it was... God, I mean, it, we wasn't even we wasn't even supposed to have been in the finals, and you know they placed it around with a change of plans, and why not bring out the you know 
the last remaining three that, you know, put in the work right there. So, I mean, they brought us out and we just fucking tore down the house at that point, you know, and, uh, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't have never imagined going up there for my first time, what it was going to consist of, but that was definitely an experience. And, uh, Hell, I wish I had another opportunity just like it, you know. Uh, don't get me wrong. Like, I loved Carnage Cup. I loved uh, – I really enjoyed uh, doing King of the Death matches. Um, I mean – work for Ian Rotten ever again, knowing what we know now about him. Yeah, a lot man, of, a lot no, of work has been burned by him, including myself. So I mean I, – With him. Yeah, the man still owes me money, if you want to be honest. I oh, mean, I, I'm just – I'm just not the top person. I'm not going to put all that bullshit out there, but no, I, I have zero respect for Ian. I mean, I put in a lot of work. I busted my ass for him. And, uh, you know, yeah, he gave me some opportunities and I went out there and I capitalized on every single one of them. You know, when things fell through, when they were trying to do the first uh, Blades of Steel match in the U.S., you know, after it was done in Japan with the Board of Open Scissors, he hit me up. I didn't hesitate in the least. He said, hey, man, uh, Blades of Steel, I want you to take the scissors board. I said, bet, I'm there, let's go. I mean, but uh, what I know now and everything else, the more I work with him, no. I mean, I have respect for what he's done in the business in the past. I ain't got no respect for him as a man. I really don't. And I don't care if he gets upset by it. I don't. Fuck you, Ian. Um, so, with that being said, all the promoters and promotions that you've worked for, who is the best businessman and who's the best promotion you've been at? And you and it's not biased if you said Deep South, because I always say that only because Kevin's been good to me over the years. <laughs> but uh, who is yours, in your opinion? I'll, I'll, I'm going to be a little bit out there. I mean... Like I said, like I love Deep South. Don't get me wrong. Kevin's always done right by me. But uh, as far as management-wise, you know, putting things together and uh, having it as clean and professional and, and, and everything coming together, uh, I got to give it to the man. Brett Lauderdale, going from being a, a referee and then the knowledge he has to pulling that shit together, I think he did an amazing job. And, I mean, he's taken that company – a lot further than I think he ever initially imagined. And so, I mean, I got to give the man props on that. You know, but like I said, Kevin's always done right by me. I love IWA Deep South. I got my opportunity with Deep South. I have, you know, I don't care what everybody else has to say. As long as you do right by me, I'm going to put in work. If you don't like me because I work for IWA Deep South, that's not your priority. You're not paying me, you know, but, but yeah. I don't care who it is. You want me to come in, put in work. All it takes is a little bit of money. I don't care. Money. I, I'm not. I, I've done it. People know who I am. All right. They know I'm tough as shit. They know I'll come in and put in the work, and I'm not going to mail it in. I'm going to give you everything I got. So there's no point in me bullshitting with anybody. You know, it is what it is. But uh, you know, I will say that much. You know, Kevin has always been real respectful towards me, and. Some of the stuff I've heard about, I honestly couldn't say I've ever heard it myself, so so I can't give my judgment on that. So, but uh, I mean, promotion wise, putting something together, especially in the very beginning, I believe you know, uh, he, GCW with Brett, man. I mean, he he fucking put some shit together. But do you think that he he a lot of that uh -huh. he's in Zandig? Uh, I mean, or he just lives a lot with Zandig. And, yeah, with Nick. And, uh, I mean, I, I think that really helped draw a lot of people to it. But, I mean, the man's got management skills. I'll give him that. I mean, he, he can manage a lot of shit, and he's got resources to pull shit together. I give him all the props in the world for putting in the effort because a lot of people wouldn't have tried to take something over like that and done what they've done. And uh, he, he turned that to be one of the biggest independent uh, wrestling organizations in the world. So, I mean – you got to give the man props on it. I mean, uh, I wish I could have had, you know, more opportunity to go back up there. 
Uh, I got to do a lot. You know, I was uh, Nate Hatred's last match, you know, before he passed away and stuff like that. I mean, I had some pretty good matches. I enjoyed it up there. And, uh, but it became a situation of, you know, it's a long way to travel for, you know, not not being quite sure how the the northern territories feel about a deep south guy kind of deal. So I mean, I don't blame the man for it. I understand that. Well, with that being said, I know what Brian's going to say, but would you ever work for Danny Demano? You really going <laughs> to ask that question? <laughs> Look, here's the thing. I didn't have any issues with Danny. I never have. When I first met him at GCW, he was a great guy. We got along great. Uh, I mean, we kind of hit it off. We chit chatted a lot while I was up there every time. You know, I honestly, I couldn't believe the shit he decided to put out there all because I went back to Deep South. I mean, it, he's going to have his feelings towards Deep South. That's his opinion. But just because I'm working there doesn't mean, you know, anything different about me. I was working there in the beginning when y'all initially booked me at GCW. That doesn't yeah. change who I am. Y'all booked me for a reason. And when I got up there, I was nothing but professional and put in the work. So, wow. I mean, if you want to be judgmental towards me, that's fine. I said, but, you know, regardless, at the end of the day, the fans are going to know who's putting in the work. And they know if I show up, I'm going to do my best to steal the whole fucking show. I respect that, though. Like, like, you know, he he ought to know that fucking Deep South is home for Bryant Woods. I mean, like, it, it's mostly always been home. You know, he's been in it since, what, Carnage Cup 8? Yep. And a lot of his work, uh, a lot of his streaming work that you can watch is Deep South. So I respect that, you know, it's just something that I ask a lot of the wrestlers. And I got – Brian's opinion, but I also wanted to get your opinion in on it. Now, if I interview a more Deep South boys, I'm going to get their opinion. It's just <laughs> I like to get everybody's opinion. Well, I just but, don't uh, have shitting on us. I mean, you know, we're we're just living a dream like any other promotion. Um, exactly. People have their personal opinions about Kevin, but that shouldn't reflect on the entire roster. Um, and again, like Brian said earlier, I've never heard Kevin say any of the things that he's been accused of or whatever over the years, but uh, Carlos Cup 13 really revived us and it put us put us on the map again. It, it got people talking about us again in a positive light because we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from Carnage Cup 13 alone. I mean, it was a stacked show full of, of big stars, big names, some of the most hard-hitting matches you've ever seen. And uh, I think that they really just showed a lot about us. We had Larry Legend there. We had... Um, um, obey we had guys that you have seen some guys you haven't seen in deep south before and it just was um a big family outing for me sort of but uh yeah that was the light that needed to be shed on deep south so that's that's how i feel about that i mean shit y'all had uh in 12 y'all had hoodfoot and remington war chap rapley uh blaine evans jay blade um and a bunch Ooh. of others so who's blaine evans never heard of us <laughs> He's that right. he's that little troll. He's that little troll or little uh, little elf that lives up in the tree making the cookies and shit. <laughs> he's a cute elf. We love you, Brian. We love you, brother. Just don't cut my finger off. You know? <laughs> oh, the finger incident come up. Oh shit. So, uh, who was your favorite opponent? Ooh. Oh shit. Ooh, put him on the spot, why don't you? Oh. Well, my third question down is really going to put him on the spot. Uh, I'll tell you what. Um, I've actually got, I've actually got three. Three, right. three of my favorite opponents. Um, and one of them I can honestly say a lot of people gave a lot of shit about, but uh, me and him had an amazing match, and I'm gonna say one of them was Corporal Robinson. Uh, me and Corp, that was a hard hitting, just rage fueled match. I mean, we had a great fucking time. In, I mean, it was a brawler style match, and uh, I, that was that was always one of my favorites. 
And then uh, after that one, I would definitely have to say uh, J.D. Horror. Oh! Me and J.D. Like, I don't know what it was. Me and J.D., we matched chemistry so well. Uh, And we went out there, you know, just trying to go easy with, with some of it. And it just never failed. It was just, we was in sync with every single thing we'd done. And we didn't really, there was almost little to no communication. We just fucking went out there and worked the ever loving hell out of each other. It was a great fucking match. And, uh, you know, me and him have talked about it several times. You know, we, we need a part two. So, uh, there again, Rob Black, I know you got, uh, JD working with you and everything. You want to see Bryant Woods and, uh, uh, JD Hoare going at it again, by all means, hit me up. Please. Matter of fact, but, we got a, uh, we're supposed to have an interview with JD and set one up. So I'll mention that to JD and see if he can get a hold of, well, he worked for Rob, so see if he'll bring it up to Rob Black and book you two to go at it. And who's yep. your third, Mr. Uh, third, man, I'll be honest. It, it started, it, it started, with a situation, you know, wasn't quite sure how things was going to go because uh, when I first started going up north, you know, towards Mid-South and everything, just a little bit of backstory, uh, I had already caught wind. You know, there was somebody a little, little – wasn't too uh, thrilled about me being there, you know, at, at the initial beginning just because of what I became known as, you know, being known as the suicidal beast. And – uh you, I mean, if you don't know who it is, then you, you must be living under a rock, and that's Masada. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, you got the ultra-violent beast versus the suicidal beast. Man, it it, it was – I wasn't sure how we were going to mesh, but that was a killer fucking match when we got to work each other at GCW. I mean, it really was. Uh I think, you know, it was one of those things where I, I had to show him I was willing to be tough enough to take what he had to give and, uh, you know, still turn around and give it right back and just show that the name just ain't a persona. It's the real fucking thing. And uh, yes. I think, you know, me and him both earned that respect with one another. And it was a great fucking match. I mean, I'd enjoy seeing another, you know, me and Masada. So, Kevin. Kevin, yeah. Rob. I mean, there's other promoters. Uh, he said, basically, if it works within his favor, he'll go to your promotion. So we do have promoters that watch our channel. So I want to see Brian Woods versus Otis Cougar. That's what I want to see. Otis? Yeah, I, would, uh, I need Brian Woods versus Drake Younger. Ooh, now that would be a banger. Hey, me, me and Drake talked uh, a couple years ago about that when he first got back out on the scene. And, uh, you know, right right after he – that's when he messed up his back. And uh, I'd actually mentioned to him and brought it up, you know, uh, I thought that would have been a killer-ass match. You know, I, shit, I would have loved to have seen that happen. I also know, you know, uh, a lot of the guys coming up, you know, with where I've been and everything, whether it be IWA, Mid-South, GCW, and everything else, guys that are showing up on AEW, I mean, shit, somebody give me a call, put in the right word, I guarantee you me and John Moxley will steal the fucking show. I can see that. I can see that. Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, that'd be a good play. <clears throat> Yeah, Tony Khan, get the ball. Uh, I mean, I think, I, I think that would be a killer fucking brutal match. Uh, I give all the respect in the world. Me and Mox talked years ago, and uh, we kind of connected on, you know, a little bit of a history with uh, something that we really relate to coming up is uh, we were huge fans of Brian Pillman. And, uh, you know, he was one of the guys that gave me some of the best uh, little tips and stuff when it came to – putting in my promos and my promos after talking with him I just sat back and I worked with a lot of my stuff and next thing you know man I put together some I thought it was some pretty damn good promos and uh it was all thanks to him man and uh I mean he he's fucking done a lot of shit that guys from the indies deathmatch workers you know uh wouldn't have thought possible because we already know WWE and places of that sort they don't 
they ain't looking at guys like us, you know, diving through barbed wire as potential good talent. But uh, he went out there and he put on a hell of a show, and he, he proved them otherwise. And uh, that's why I enjoy throwing the crowd off sometimes, you know, going out there and just throwing some chain chain wrestling and everything out there just to fuck them all up. You know, they see me come out there. They know shit's about to get bloody, but then all of a sudden they're like, holy shit, he can fucking work. <laughs> you know, it just – it. It, it's great. I enjoy. I enjoy like that. That psychology of uh, fucking with the crowd too. So. So I have to ask: Could we get the suicidal beast versus the atrocity cruel? Oh yeah. Mm. I mean, somebody wants to book it. Hell, we right there. So, with that being said, I don't know if y'all three know or not, but the Carver's back. Who? The Carver. Oh. I'd like to see him and the Carver go the fuck at it. I'd like to see him and Michael Kruger go at it. Uh, me and Kruger, uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, we were supposed to have had a match at IWA Mid-South. I think something fell through on that one. Probably but, flight, like it did at Carnage Cup. His what? Yeah. His flight plans, probably. Yeah, I asked him about uh, him working in no. Deep South, and he said he, he missed his flight. And um, if Kevin ever wants to book him again, he said he would gladly go. Uh, correction on this. Correction. That's Michael Kruger. I think I, I'm i not even thinking in the right place. He's from California, right? Arizona, I think. Arizona, Arizona. ain't it? Uh, where, where's like the, the big black suit with the mask? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Uh, me and him did work at IWA Mid-South. And, and, you and need to go back and watch. Uh, yeah, me and him did work. Yeah. It was Deep South, I think, that he was, you know, he was supposed to fly to Deep South and he missed his flight or something like that. Yeah. Him versus a, Bryant versus Akira would be good too. Right, let's put him, Bryant. Hey, me and Akira, me and Akira got to work uh, at the first Gypsy Joe tournament. I know that one. I, I, yeah, they. I actually have a question on the three, the three rejects he he fought, but I cannot find the Gypsy tournament anywhere it's on YouTube, on title match, nothing. So the, the Gypsy Joe tournament was kind of put together, uh, freak show. Freak Show got that together. And, uh, yeah, I actually won that tournament. And uh, me and Akira got to work with each other there. That's actually one of my questions was, um, let me find it. How did you feel facing the rejects, John Wayne Murdoch, Akira, and Reed Bentley? Uh, I was just another day in the office. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I ever had any uh, – <laughs> Bad run-ins with any of them. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think I've seen you and Murdoch go at it before. But me and Murdoch, me and Murdoch's had a couple, you know, uh, like shared matches and everything. We we've never had a one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, we, we've always seemed to, you know, kind of mesh pretty well. Uh, I know. Like I said, me, him, and Marcus Crane with Danny Havoc at GCW. I, I mean, me, me, Marcus, and uh, John. We we went on the road several times to GCW and uh, everything else, just kind of carpooling and having a great time. We kind of got real close there for a while, and uh, man, I had a blast out there with them. We had a great fucking time. Oh uh, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't. I haven't really kept track with a lot of shit that's went on over the last uh, couple of years just because I've had so much going on myself. But uh, some, I've gotten bits and pieces of some uh, backlash on, on some stuff here and there. Man, shit happens. I mean, that's understandable. Hell, I ain't got nothing bad to say about them. I ain't got, you know, nothing but good run-ins and everything else. You know, if somebody wanted to book me and John or me and Akira, me and Reed, hell, I'm there. It ain't going to change my opinion any. Hell right. 
on about you, they're talking about you. Publicity is publicity, no matter how you get it, in my opinion. Right. You can hate me all you want, but, but you know, still talking no. about me. I'm living rent. They, all, they all want to run their mouths all over social media, but ain't none of them willing to step face to face with me. I, I don't think you, nobody in the right state of mind wants to step in the ring with a suicidal beast. I mean, that's just my opinion, but. Well, it's easy to be a mark on the other side of the keyboard, but until you come on the other side of that guardrail and get in there and do what we do and be put through what this man has been through, uh, what I've been through, what other work, until you get across that guardrail and take that first bump, uh, your opinion is null and void to me. I mean, yeah, the fans make you or break you, but, I mean, uh, these keyboard warriors, these marks, well, you're going to be just that, a mark your whole damn life, which we all are marks in the business, in my opinion. I make this post on, like, once a month about y'all wrestlers. You know, if you ain't doing it and you don't know the inside detail, like me and Squirrel's been having this channel for about a year and then we started clicking with wrestlers. But if you don't know the inside detail while they're doing it, you know, everything about them, keep your motherfucking mouth closed. Well, I, I mean, mean he, can, he, can shut, he can shut their mouth. Don't get me wrong. I mean, <laughs> I, me personally, you know how I look at y'all wrestlers like y'all are fucking y'all a god or something because y'all doing this shit. Y'all putting y'all's life on the line. You know you got family back home, you got animals, you got you got a life to attend to back home. So y'all don't know what the fuck's gonna happen. It's not like regular wrestling can get you hurt, but a death match is so much more well, severe. We don't have insurance like that. <laughs> exactly, and like whatever happens. In a death match, basically. I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> hey, look, and I'll be honest with you. Having insurance, it really don't go nowhere because if you go to a hospital and you tell them that you were wrestling and you got fucked up, insurance won't cover. Oh, so, like, I kid fuck? you not, like, I, I've got insurance. Every time I've got hurt, I'll, I promise you I've lied out of my ass. It's like, oh, how did you end up with 16 broken bones in your foot? Well, see, what happened was uh, I rolled my foot off some steps, you know. It's like – why are you so cut up? Well, there was there there was some barbed wire meshing at the bottom of my my steps that I was putting up around the fence line. And I fell in it. Like well, I'm, I've been hit by I'm, I'm gonna bottom. come up with some shit. You know, I severed the tendons in my hand. They're like, well, how did you do this? Uh, no, I did not do a moonsault off the top rope and land with a uh, fluorescent t tube going through my hand. Uh, I tripped in a parking lot, leaving a bar, and I landed on some beer bottle glass. Like. Like, I come up with some shit, okay? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what I tell people, man. This, this ain't ballet. Man. Ooh, something like that. God. I, they asked me, I tell them, I, I got hit by a semi trip, which I did shoot. I did get hit by a semi, but if I got to ring with you, I'd be like, I got to hit by a semi. What kind? Oh, woods trucking, I think, or something like that. The beast, I got hit by the beast mobile. What the hell is that? Yeah, really? We'll just I mean, call him up. Hey, <laughs> Brian, 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 just remember that. You know, eventually Kevin's going to put that together, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Next question. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> of all the places you have wrestled, where have, did you get the loudest crowd reaction? Uh, man, I, shit, honestly, it, it goes back to GCW, man. I, I literally walked in, wasn't sure how the, the fans was going to react. And, man, they blew the roof off the place. Like, they was ecstatic to see me up north. You know, I wasn't even prepared for the reaction I got. So, yeah, I mean... Hell, the fans up that way, they're die hard, man. So them following me while I was at Deep South and then coming up north, shit, it, it was it it was stunning at just how loud it was. I I was surprised. I understand that. So um I actually talked to you about this yesterday. What is your most bloodiest match in your opinion? Uh, me and Insane Lane at Carnage Cup 10. Uh, yeah, because I faced Lane in the first round and a uh, barbed wire ropes 
and uh, fluorescent tubes and lit candles match. And I ended up, if you go back and watch the video, and there's a point where I'm literally just, just spewing blood leaking. Uh, it was so bad after the first match. Luckily, uh, my second and third round wasn't until the next day. But it, by the end of the first match, like everybody was trying to get me to go to the hospital because I was turning so pale. Uh, like it was, it was pretty bad. Uh, fluorescent tube right there in the top of the head. It, I mean, it just stabbed all the way through and cut like that top artery. And it just, I mean, you can go back the next day, me and court, when he stabbed the syringe through my face, if you look while I'm laying on the ground, I'm kind of shaking with the syringe through my mouth. You can see my head just looks like a water faucet of blood. And I mean, yeah. it's just growing a puddle right there. I mean, and, and it's quickly growing. It wasn't just hesitant. Like, it was bad. Honestly, I would say you and Little Sicko, especially after that U-Haul drive and that. That looked like a that, murder scene. That tarp being covered in blood. I was like, Jesus. The and, next, that puddle was still there. The next day was still a big old puddle that just sitting right there where Brian, where Brian him went. And he hold, that, hold that thought real quick. I got something to show you. Oh, shit, now. Exclusive. Oh, fuck. Exclusive. What's he got? What's he so, got? All right, so a lot of that wasn't blood necessarily like our backs and shit were fucked up. This is my gear pants from after. What uh, the fuck? Oh, like, shit. The, the barbed wire and the glass literally like went through both layers. Like the back side of my leg and like the top whole left side of my ass cheek. I, I was pulling shards of glass out that was, you know, two, three inches long. Like, it was bad. You need to sell that uh, gear. Hint, hint. I was kind of, yeah. I actually plan on uh, doing just that because uh, these are retired, bro. Oh, How, much, so how much would you sell them for? I don't know yet. I ain't quite decided. Acquiring minds would like to know. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You got three people on here. Uh, already I, ready. Hey, look. And, and this is all original. They, they've not been washed. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. And, like, you know, the top bleeders for me would have to be you, uh, Matt Tremont, Necro, and you got to put RSP in there because he's got that fucking bleeding disorder thing. Yeah. For his gushers, yeah, yeah. Gushers, yeah. But, but honestly, I'd say you... Tremont for sure, you, and Necro. You know, Sicko has a disorder where his blood clots real quickly. I don't know how you got him to bleed as much as he did at Cup, but, I mean, it's hard. Like, I remember at Violet Shit Cup, him and his, his, the guy he faced, they tried everything they could to get him to lay open. He bleeds just a little bit, it clawed up. He bleeds a little bit, clawed up. But that whole match with, with you – no, nah, there there was no way it could clot. I mean, I guess they were just that big of gashes or something. I don't know. Well, when when you start taking headbutts <laughs> like that, it tends to swell up and uh, keep it open. So, cool. it was the most sickening thud I've ever heard when Bryant gave him that hit. Because like, it, I don't I don't know how to describe it. It's just unlike any sound you've ever heard in your life. Like it's just like how did a human being do that? The other one is still walking. You know what I mean? Like it was just a sick, just thud. You know. What was it like to be in Lords of Anarchy tournament? Oh, oh shit! Uh, that one, that one was pretty cool. You know, uh, I didn't do a whole lot while I was there. I got to work. You know, uh, a couple of guys. You know, I'd already been with. Uh, it was pretty fun. I think one of the biggest things I was worried about is the. Uh, in that first round match when they had like the damn 12 foot tubes strapped up uh, across the ropes, uh, I'd already told, uh, I can't even think of the guy's name. He, he's Fred. from Canada. Um, 
Which oh, I was thinking about Fred. He used to run that show. I think Fred West did. I think. I think. Don't but uh, I can't even think of the guy's name I, I was working with right now. I've got horrible memory. I've been hit in the head once a bunch of times. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the only thing I could think of was I was like, all right, we can't necessarily swing these giant ass tubes because we got a low ceiling. I was like, fuck it. I was like, I'm going to fucking dive through these motherfuckers. And the only thing I could think of the whole time, like I was in the back talking with uh, several of my buddies and they were like, man, don't do that shit. You're going to end up just like Nick. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm on. So like when you, you see me go through it, like I took my arm yeah. and I snatched the rope and I just kind of tucked everything in to dive through it and I hit the ground so fucking hard. There was no bracing. I just fucking dove through that shit. But I was like, nope, keeping that underarm tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh yeah, it, it was pretty cool. They they uh it was Jesse Amato is who I was working with. But uh they told us what was so crazy is they were like, whatever you do, stay off the guardrail. So what we do, we fucked up the guardrail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one one thing that Necro is obsessed with is his fucking guardrails. Like, if you watch XPW, he's always got these damn guardrails. And I mean, like, even in his older days, I seen him and JD Horde at um, this past Merry Christmas or whatever it's called, Merry After Christmas or something like that. And uh, he's just pounding the shit out of JD. He also got uh, Chuck Stone with the fucking uh, guardrails. Them things ain't light either. Let me, let me go on record and say, them things are not light. They're not aluminum like everybody thinks. That is, that hurts. They're steel, ain't they? Yeah. No. Yeah. That's what I thought. Some it people hurts. say they're aluminum. I'm like, no, them got to be either steel or metal. No, you see them strain to pick these things up. I mean, they still weight to them. Yeah. So, uh, where do you see your career in five or ten years from now? Um, Honestly, man, I can't even tell you because this time last year I was looking to completely retire. I mean, I I just, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to feel getting back to the ring. I wasn't sure, you know, how I was going to be able to function, you know, as far as uh, dealing with everything where I'd been with my knee now. And, you know, now it's not just my hip and my foot, you know, now I'm, the other yeah. leg, my knee is replaced and uh, having, you know, limited mobility and how far that knee can bend and shit. And, but uh, I don't know, you know, just like any other time, I, I end up getting back in there and I compensate and cover it. And next thing you know, I'm wide open all over again. And it just kind of keeps going from there. So, I mean, honestly, I don't know where I'm going to end up, but. We'll Either way, I'm going to be at peace no matter what, whether I'm out there putting on a show or sitting at home enjoying watching the the guys that, you know, follow me into the business putting on a show. You know, I'm, I'm going to be at peace with whatever decision I make. That's a guarantee. Well, with that being said, what we noticed if you watched the pay-per-view, um, when you held that title, there was tears in your eyes. What was going through your mind at that very moment? Um. If you care to share about that, if you don't, you don't have to. Honestly, man, it, it was Spider. Um, he had said long ago, you know, that was something that uh, he knew I would end up doing. And uh, whenever I, I started, you know, crawling out of the depths and started going everywhere, you know, he, he was real proud of me. You know, and like I said, I didn't have no family or nothing. And so... For me to kind of carry that title and that that Carnage Cup victory, you know, the same thing that he got to carry, I don't know, it just, it it really hit me in that moment because, you know, not just him, but uh, Lil Sicko's dad, you know, he worked for IWA Deep South. You know, guys that I came up with that were, you know, perceived as, you know, deathmatch legends of this territory and... I finally had the opportunity to capitalize on it, and uh, it just, I wasn't expecting it, but it just, it, it just kind of hit me like a wave, and it was almost overwhelming. Uh, so, yeah, 
I mean, I'm a grown ass man, but I mean, it, it, it was bittersweet, tears of joy kind of situation. I, I can relate. That's that's exactly. Well, that and a lot of other things went through my mind when I won the gauntlet. Um, of course, first thing I thought of, I mean, of course you think of Spider, but the next person I thought of was John Rare, who helped me get to this point in my career, who who pushed me to, to come to Deep South. Um, I thought about, you know, 13 fucking years of people just shitting on me and saying I'd never be a goddamn thing in this business. I'd never make it. Um, you know, all the hatred and all the pain and everything, it all accumulated in that one moment just to have, and to me, that's my WrestleMania moment. Like, that was the biggest moment of my career. Um, so I can totally relate to that. But, yeah, you notice it visibly. There's emotions just coming all over you as soon as you down, you know, as soon as that belt hits your hands, it's like reality sets into you. Like, holy shit, IWA Deep South Heavyweight Champion and I won Carnage Cup. You know, that that's that's something to hold your hat. Go ahead, Squirrel. What would you say is your biggest accomplishment in the business so far? Uh, it's probably winning Carnage Cup, to be honest. I mean, I a lot of my accomplishments, you know, just being able to get out of this territory and being able to travel and uh, – the way people perceive a lot of the guys from the deep South area, you know, um, that meant a lot, you know, that, that I was able to get out and, and show what I was capable of, even after being told whenever I first started coming in that I wasn't going to be able to do shit, you know, uh, being limited after my hip and everything else. So for it all to kind of run full circle and me be able to say, hey, I left the area. I even showed y'all how much I had to offer, and I, I took everything y'all had to give, and I gave it right back to you. And uh, for me to kind of return home kind of situation and, and carry that title, it, it it means a lot. It really does. Well, we're proud to have you as our champion. That's for damn sure. We, I mean, we have a lot to be proud of, but. I mean, you you fit the the quote of a heavyweight champion, um, of a ring general, a locker room general. We we we're proud to have you as, as representing the Deep South. So, who gave the beast a run for his money? <laughs> yeah, who who's ever really gave you a run for your money, Bryant? Probably one of the toughest men I've ever been in the ring with, and I'll give it to him right now. And like I said. They booked the match. I'm willing to put it all on the line. Slack is one hell of a fucking swinger, man. Oh. Like, uh, I was, I was not quite prepared for how intense he was going to come with it, and so I, it pushed me to step up that much harder. Uh, and I think that's why me and him just kind of meshed as far as. Uh, the intensity, you know, he he's very over the top with his intensity. And, I, you know, I'm real level as far as uh, being a lot more laid back, but super, you know, uh, aggressive in a sense when the point gets there. So uh, he just kind of brought to life a lot more aggression within me to uh, hold that hold up my end of the match. And it, it damn sure came together pretty well. And so. I'll say he, he gave me a run for my money. He's one tough motherfucker. I give him that much. I mean, he's a lot. He's a lot. He's a lot shorter than me. He really is. But by God, he he fucking he'll bring it. <laughs> I love fucking slack. Did, did he rock you? Oh, he did. I rocked him right back, but he did. <laughs> Fuck yeah. That's the fairest answer I've heard ever. I mean, I, I already knew being in the ring with Necro, you know, <laughs> at Carnage Cup, like in the back. If y'all notice, I never take my facial jewelry out. Yeah. And so when I went into Carnage Cup and it was me, him, and Jimmy, uh, I was sitting in the back and we were just kind of, you know, doing our thing. And I started taking my facial jewelry out. And he, even Jimmy was like, wait a minute, don't you? Normally keep all your stuff in. I said, "Yeah, not against Necro." Mm -mm. <laughs> he was like, "Uh, 
Do I need to worry? I said, no. You ain't got to worry about nothing. Bullshit. Y'all killed that boy. Y'all killed that poor boy. Don't don't get me started, Brian. Don't. Especially that U-Haul spot. Or, 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 or when fucking Brian threw, Brian threw him like he was fucking paper. I, I bring this up in all of my videos almost, and you can watch it back. When Jimmy got thrown, I know it's not funny, but I died laughing. And when Necro drove him into that U-Haul, and then he comes after you like you're going fucking, I don't know, barely touch him or something. I'm like, you're going to get the shit bit out of you here. Let the two big men fight. Let them <laughs> wear their self down. Then you can go after somebody. If, In my opinion, if I was in that match, which I'm never going to be, thank God, but if you and Necker are fighting, I'm just going to stand there and let y'all two fucking fight. I'm sorry. And you come at me, I'm going to find me something to at big least big bring big you big down big. on one knee. And I don't, so with all your surgeries, are you like, I don't know how to put it, like is your body like fake or mostly made up of like steel gods man. or you the are you like, uh, is you like the real I, I mean, I don't, it, a lot of my surgeries don't necessarily uh, have like metal and everything. Uh, my hip and my knee is titanium. Uh, and then my right foot has got uh, two plates and four pins going through it. Uh, but the rest of my body has just been kind of going in, doing simple repairs and letting it heal up. Uh, I mean, shit, I can't say this, but like, I almost have no feeling in my knee. So, like, I, I literally almost like the, the skin area, all that around the top of my knee, like I feel nothing. So that's something I plan on uh, incorporating fairly soon is, is a fucking bionic knee to the face kind of situation. We're going to see how that plays out. You know, you've heard of the bionic elbow. I'm going <laughs> to do a running bionic knee to the face. That That's going to fucking hurt, especially with how big his fucking knee cap is alone and his fucking I You know, you, uh, you mentioned you wrestled as a tag team. Do you prefer to be a tag team or in a uh, be a singles competitor? Uh, I like the singles competitor a lot more, just because I I get that one on one interaction, and I don't have to feel that depending on anybody else to kind of pick up the slack. Uh, but I have had some really good tag team. Uh, situations, you know, me and Spider, we had some great tag team matches. Uh, you know, we was known as the sickness, and uh, it it was definitely a lot of people. I'll be honest, there was a lot of tag teams that was they were not willing to get in the ring with us. But I understand uh, that. yeah, so how did you feel when and getting the deep south belt after everything you have put your body through? Uh, you know, it goes back into that same situation that I was talking about earlier. It's kind of like a, uh, it, it was an overwhelming kind of situation. Uh, you know, for me to keep just driving, it, it just, for me, it was finally that, that whole aspect of I, I finally did it. I finally brought to life, you know, what I've been working towards over all this time, you know, all the yes, stuff sir. I put my stuff through, it's finally paid off kind of deal. So, yes, sir. Um, so since Ian Rotten don't run King of the Death matches anymore, would we ever see the Beast back in King of the Death matches? Uh, Circle I don't six. even know. I, I don't even know who's running King of the Death anymore. Circle Six. Circle Six. Yes, Man. Sir. It, if I'm not mistaken, Addison Kogar's big on with Circle Six, ain't he? Uh, Atticus Kogar, Otis, uh, Casanova does commentary over there. Kevin Dill okay. Gil does commentary. Uh, it's mostly when it was first came out, it was all the four for all boys was running it yeah. more or less. I mean, if they decided that. Uh, King of the Death, they wanted to call up the Suicidal Beast, you know, 
we'll we'll work something out all the same, you know. Uh, like I said, I'm not work I'm not going to work for anybody that screws me over. But as as long as somebody does right by me, I'm going to show up. I'm going to give them, you know, all the respect and all the work I can, you know. But if you screw me over, you know, it don't take but once. I'm done with you. I understand that. I understand that. I respect that a lot. A lot. I mean, um, have you ever been in TOD, Tournament of Death? No, I never got to work with uh, them so. up at CVW. Uh, DJ Hyde actually runs it now. I'm you, yeah. pretty sure you know that. Um, I'd like to see you in TOD if we can get you over in there. Uh, I talked to DJ a long time ago about that situation. And at that point in time, uh, it was just kind of a hit and miss situation. You know, we talked about it. And then whenever, uh, it, you know, it it was real awkward at the time because CZW was kind of low on, on uh, crowd and so on and so forth at the time. That was, you know, right around when GCW was starting to really build and everything else. And CZW was kind of taking a hit there for a minute. and uh, But I, I haven't spoken with him in a long time. But, yeah, we had talked about the possibility of it before. And, I mean, there again, you know, if DJ hit me up and wanted me to come in, you know, we could definitely work something out on that end. Have you ever wrestled at the gathering? Oh, yeah. I've never. 20 in in 2016, me and Joe McDougal, uh, we uh, worked at the gathering. Uh, yeah, that was that was a pretty good match. I was actually, if you go back 2017, 2018, and I believe 2019, uh, me and Joe McDougal, the one of the photos they had of us in the match was one of the promotional photos that they posted to cover for JCW The Gathering for like two or three years in a row. Hell yeah. Who was your favorite wrestler when you was younger? Like a kid or growing up? or what? Who's somebody that you uh, always looked up to? Uh, I, I, was, I was a real big Brian Pillman fan uh, just for, you know, a lot of his character antics and so on and so forth. He was a hell of a worker. Uh, I mean, he was one of those that got taken way too soon. Uh, yeah. Not just career wise, but you know, you know, dying as well. I mean, we lost a, a great talent with him just getting injured to begin with, much less you know him passing away. And then uh, uh, after that. I was a big Triple H fan, of course. You know, he was one of the guys I, I, I kind of see myself matching a lot of. But uh, then I grew up and I realized I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm a lot bigger than he is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was a Triple H fan growing up. But, you know, I would, I would, t I would take Michaels over Triple H. Um, Oh, don't get me wrong, Michaels, Michaels, he, he was a showboat, man. He he was there to entertain, and he done just that. Yes, uh, sir. The, the Triple H aspect was just pure psychology. I loved the intensity and psychology that it would bring to a match and, and his facial expressions and selling everything to the crowd. It, it He told a story just with his, his face. You know, he didn't have to speak. He didn't have to be sitting there wrestling the entire match. His reactions alone could tell a story. And yeah. uh, I, I looked into a lot of that whenever I was first coming up. So uh, what's one up-and-coming wrestler you have your eye on? Honestly, I mean, I mentioned it earlier. I, I wasn't 100% sure, but I've seen a lot of stuff he's done. Uh and I've seen where he's kind of caught some flack here and there, but man, I've seen some awesome work by Atticus, Atticus Coger. And uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, man, uh, yeah, I'd love to get in the ring with him. I think me and him could have some good little uh, teardown yeah. matches, you know. Uh, but yeah, I kind of followed along a lot with his stuff uh, over the last couple of years. And uh, for him to kind of start where he was, you know, wasn't really gaining much momentum with them. Then him turn around, kind of take it all by storm kind of situation. 
he definitely put in some work. So uh, I, he's always stood out to me. I understand that. Go ahead, Squirrel. I know you, you've you done technical and deathmatch. Do you prefer technical wrestling or deathmatch wrestling? Uh, I mean, is it really a deathmatch without some kind of technical match in it? I mean, True. I enjoy <laughs> splicing a little bit of everything. I mean, you, you got to have your technicalities to be able to, to put the whole deathmatch together. Otherwise, all you're doing is just going out there and throwing <laughs> shit at each other. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm a firm believer in you got to have both to really tell that story and make it pull together. So... My other question is, who would you pass the torch to and why? In my personal opinion, it would be a little sicko. Uh, I'm going to keep that to myself. I respect that, honestly. Coming from the business, I'm, you know, with everything I, that you've I've done. Got, I've got, uh, depending on how things play out over the next several months, uh, whenever I decide to, uh, to do just that, uh, I've I've got a couple different people in mind, and uh, depending on the right stipulation and the right uh, place, right time kind of deal, you know, I know that if I pass it to any of the ones that, that I've got in mind, it would definitely be well worth the efforts. I respect that. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, uh, can we ask about how you enjoy doing your strongman competitions that you do? Uh, well, that one was another one that was kind of thrown at me. You know, I've always been strong, you know, real big and everything else. And with all the injuries, I watched strongman and everything growing up. So I was already a fan of it. You know, I was a fan long before Eddie Hall and Brian Shaw and all them really started picking up you know i was a fan of uh big z and, and uh several others you know even uh hell there was a couple you know even before mark henry and stuff which mark henry didn't win world strongest man who won arnold uh strong man so uh but i mean he at that point in time i mean that was one of the strongest events but uh I wasn't quite sure where I was strength-wise, and I knew, like, there was almost nobody at the gym and stuff that I worked out with. Nobody could, you know, remotely stay with where I was and what I was lifting. And so I knew that I was stronger than most. And then uh, a friend of mine that I worked with kept telling me that, you know, I needed to I needed to look into doing more. You know, I, that my size was a lot more than, uh, you know, far further than the average, of course, which I already knew. But it didn't put a lot of it in, into perspective until uh, I ended up talking with her cousin. Her cousin used to play for the Green Bay Packers, and he, real big guy, you know. Uh, and she showed him videos at their at their Christmas family get together and everything, and he was blown away with what I was moving. He he even flat out said that, you know, there were majority of the guys that he played with. He he had never seen them move that kind of weight. Even Damn. some of the biggest linemen he he had you know played with, and I was like. Okay, so maybe maybe I'm a lot further than what I realized, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I got I, I did some of my top lifts, and I sent it in to Strongman Incorporated, and uh, about a month later they replied to me and they said, "How soon do you want to compete?" Uh, I I literally it was that just like that, and so uh, I trained up because a lot of the equipment and everything that we use in competition is not like just going to a gym. And so I had to find gyms to go to uh, that had the equipment I needed. I even purchased a bunch of equipment to train from home. And I went into my first competition last August at Alabama Strongest Man, and then I ended up finishing in ninth place. I had a heat stroke. Yeah, I had a heat stroke in the third event. Uh, up until that point, I was in the top five. 
uh, for my very first competition, and uh, I went into the the medley, which is one of my best events, um, and it was a three item medley. It was a two hundred and ninety pound uh, iron cross, and then a two hundred and fifty pound uh, fire hydrant. Excuse me while I let my damn cat out. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. I'm a pet owner myself. <laughs> but, uh, and then the third, one, the third one was like a, uh, I think it was like a hundred and hundred and ninety pound pylon, which is a giant wooden log. Uh, majority of the guys couldn't even carry the iron cross uh, a couple of steps, and I snatched it up and I took off running. And about halfway down, I blacked out. And uh, I lost all strength in my arms. I couldn't hold anything. And then I just kind of opened my eyes. I was out on the ground. My coaches was running over, ripping everything off of me. And uh, I was severely dehydrated. It was 116 degrees outside. Uh, it all happened because in the first event, uh, I got the wind knocked out of me. We, we had to do tug of war. And I slipped in the sand and landed all with my elbow tucked into my ribs. And it knocked the breath out of me, and I started throwing up. And I threw up everything I took in that morning, all my liquids, all my carbs, everything. And so by the time we made it to the medley, like, I was starting to get lightheaded already. And uh, I, like I said, I couldn't just start turning around, start chugging water and Gatorades. It was just going to make me more sick. And yeah. so uh, I had a heat stroke in the third event, and I, I argued with the coaches to let me do the deadlift. I went out there, and the whole plan was I was just going to pull one. They they told me, you know, look, go pull one rep just so you can put, you know, a point on the board and be done. And uh, I got out there, and I pulled one rep, and everything from my abdomen down cramped up. And I dropped the weight, and I almost fell out again. And they were like, you're done. So I wasn't allowed to uh, try for the Atlas Stones, another one of my good events, or anything. So with that, without being able to fully finish, I still ended up coming in ninth place. That's, that's pretty fucking good, actually. So do you think wrestling, like, intensified and helped you with your strongman career? Uh and in a certain little aspect, not not a lot. I mean, it was just because with the wrestling, you know, I already had to be strong and everything to be able yeah. to, to move people. Uh, so, I mean, I was already pushing myself to be stronger anyways. And so getting into strongman, I already had that background. I already had so, a, a solid base to start from. I wasn't coming in fresh with nothing. And uh, so it did help me in that aspect, but other than you know, other than that, wrestling does nothing for it. It's nothing as close to going out there and just picking up extremely heavy shit and putting it back down, kind of deal. You know, who can move the heaviest weight the quickest? You know, it's not the same as wrestling. Uh, I will say, guys like Evan Singleton, uh, he used to work for WWE, and uh, he's now one of the top world strongest men and uh he still loves to go out and, and he's big about getting the crowd hyped up and drawing them into the event all because that's what he's used to he, he feeds off crowd reaction so i enjoy doing a lot of the same so um do you do like ripping bone books and you know the railroad spikes bending them and stuff uh I, honestly i've never tried it I mean, I know the technique. I probably could, but I've never tried it. A lot of a lot of people would probably like to see you do that. Maybe I'm one, honestly. I'm on. I'm trying to start a little series on TikTok or something. Maybe me trying to do some yes. stuff. Yes, definitely. Because <laughs> um, TikTok has strongmen, so I think they have a strongman competition on TikTok. I may be wrong. Don't hold me to it, but 
I haven't ever came across one. I know they show like a lot of footage and everything from events, but nothing like a, a specialty event other than like TikTok sponsoring an event of some sorts. Well, then I'm probably wrong. <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, what is your favorite sports team? My favorite sports team? Uh, North Alabama, roll tide, baby. <laughs> ah. Okay, I respect that. Uh, my favorite college team is probably going to get you laughed at, but it's from where I'm from, so it's Kentucky. But I, mean, I, used, to, I used to live in Kentucky. Oh, shit. I, I, I was born in raised here, so I was born in 99. I'm 24. Um, so I've lived here all my life. I mean, like, I've lived up in Somerset, so. I, whenever I lived there, I lived in Owensboro. Yeah, that's above me, I think. So, yeah, uh, but in professional football, I like the Kansas City Chiefs. I did like, I know you're probably going to laugh at me, but I was a Brady fan when Brady was around. And now I'm a Patrick Mahomes fan. Uh, I don't watch much pro ball or anything of the sorts. Uh, the only the, the only sports I really watch, if I watch it besides wrestling, is college football. And I don't even watch a whole lot of it. After I got injured in school, I kind of lost out on scholarship opportunities. It kind of took a lot of that, you know, uh, pleasure out of me. But, uh, uh, you know, I do watch college ball from time to time, but that's about it. So you basically answered this question. It was, how was it facing Spider Budro and Marcus Curry? Uh, I mean, like I said, <laughs> it was another day at the office. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, two, two of my real close friends, I mean, uh, me and Marcus always we we had a blast together every single time because we always just we we went out there to make people laugh at the same time. So as as serious and as hard hitting as it would get, we would try to splice in you know some some goof spots in there to make it just a little bit more enjoyable. Because I mean, you look at it. I mean, I'm six foot six, three hundred pounds. I mean, Marcus didn't compare size wise. So we yeah. had you know. To tell that story, you had to kind of shake it up a little bit, and, and we just – we had fun. We had a blast. Now, me and Spider, we could go out there. Even though Spider was a big guy, I still towered over Spider. Um, but me and him would just go out there, and they, we were best friends. So if you go back and watch any of the stuff me and him did, we didn't pull much of anything. We literally just beat the dog shit out of each other. I mean, So – go ahead. Sorry. I was gonna say it was it, it was never there was never an event where me and Spider worked where I didn't go home and go yeah it's gonna hurt to eat for the next couple of days. <laughs> so since you've basically been through it all, what weapon do you think is the most brutal? Man, uh. I don't know if I go. I know the scissor board sucked. Oh. It really did. Uh, but nice. between that and fire, I mean, both of them. I mean, they, to to feel that burn from from fire, uh, it was so intense. Like anytime I see people out now, and I see people that's been you know scarred up real bad from burns. You know, like there's a there's a woman that works at my job. Uh, apparently, when she was younger, uh, she was helping her mom cook, and she snatched a pot of boiling water off of the stove, and it just destroyed her face, kind of deal. And just when I seen her, I immediately like the thought of what she went through compared to what I went through. I. I literally, I walked up to her, I said, look, no disrespect in any sort of way, but I just want you to know I do understand, and uh, God bless everything that you're going through, and, and I wish you the best, because I, I can't imagine how her life's been since that incident. 
probably numerous surgeries and everything. And mine, yeah, mine was bad. 17% of my back and every body. But, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine it being all over my face and everything. So, between the fire and the scissors board, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, I've come to the conclusion that we leave fire up to John Rare. <laughs> That's John's thing. Like, yeah. that and fireworks. I, I don't think there's a match I ain't seen John – either get blowed up or caught on fire besides maybe I would, rather, I would rather do fireworks than be caught on fire mm, i'd rather do neither but i guess i'd agree with you if i have to i'd rather do fireworks i mean like you know and um when he first faced spider budro i don't think there was anything in that one but cornish cup 11 it was just like he he got wrapped up in the bundle, 13 he was wrapped up, you know, 12 he was wrapped up. He He's ever for more getting blown up by fireworks. And I don't I don't know if he, like, that's his thing. I, I say it's his thing. Like, he feeds off of fucking fireworks. Besides your gauges and piercings, do you wear any other jewelry while you wrestle? Uh, no, that's the only thing. I, I take out my earrings. Um, but everything else in my face, normally I, I keep all my jewelry in. I understand that. I mean, it um, has caused some incidences. I mean, uh, like J.D. Hoare ripped his eyebrow ring out with a pair of pliers. Oh, fuck. Uh, my septum. Oh, shit. Got, I had, uh, if you go back and look at old videos and everything, I had my, my septum was gauged up to a zero. And in a match against Brad Cash, uh, his elbow pad caught it and ripped it out. Oh. So now I've got a horseshoe as a septum, like it's completely separated. So, um, give more of a, I, a question. Another question I have is: Do you feel more like a heel or a baby face? In my opinion, you're a baby face. <laughs> Uh, I, honestly, I honestly couldn't even tell you an answer to that because uh, I've tried. Was it, it's one of those situations where I try. I've tried so hard to be healed sometimes, and in the right situation, it does work. But majority of the time. They they love everything I'm doing. Even even when I'm trying to be healed, they still want to cheer me because they they feed off of everything I do. Like I'll be cussing them like a dog, and they'll they'll give me shit right back, and then turn around and cheer me for it. And I'm just like, this makes no sense whatsoever. I, I kind of call it the DX uh, strategy. You know, yeah, it's so so cool to be healed kind of deal. You know him. Uh, between DX and, and the fucking Outsiders, man, uh, you know, it was cool to be the bad guy kind of deal. So I kind of feel like that's where it's played out with me. You know, they love to hate me kind of situation. I understand that. I think you might have already answered it, but what was it like to be in the inaugural tournament of survival? Uh, man, it, it was an honor. It really was. I mean, Zandig reached out to me and uh, flat out told me, you know, he loved everything he had seen me doing and uh, asked me to come in. I was one of the first people he had on his list. So, I mean, to me, it was, it was honestly an honor for him to want to call me up there. So, definitely, Zandig, if you're watching this, hey, I appreciate it, brother. So, how old was you when you faced John Rare in the Razor Edge death match? You don't look no older than, like, 20 at the most. I, I was probably about – I was older than that because me and Spider didn't start hanging out until I was 23 or 22. Uh, I was probably – I was probably about 25. It's been about 10 years ago. Damn, you do not look. That, damn, you did not look it. I'm, I'm, you got a baby face from hell. I'm sorry. <laughs> like I was like, I, I must have squirrel. I'm like, I'm watching him and John Rayer and on how to match, 
And I sent him a picture, and he was like, is that Brian? I was like, yeah, that he, that's Brian Woods when he was younger. And I'm like, he's no older than 18 to 20 at the most. I'm like, I'm going to have to ask him, you know. He, he, he looks so young. <clears throat> so another question is probably going to take you back through history. I know it was bad, but how bad was it when Spider threw you off into the Bob Wire contraption at Carnage Cup 8 on the U-Haul? Uh, the worst part about that was Spider, like, landed straight onto my stomach. Like, I, I was literally laying there feeling like I was about to puke. Uh, just because, I mean, Spider was not a small guy, so when he landed, he landed hard. Uh, <coughs> the, worst, the worst part about it was because when the barbed wire broke, if you go back and look real close, there was barbed wire wrapped around my throat. So every time I was trying to move, it was pulling and cutting into my neck. Oh, so that one, that the the bump itself coming off, it wasn't that bad. But the uh, aftermath impact, with, you know, with spider landing on top of me and the, then the barbed wire being wrapped all around me, me being engulfed in it, it, that sucked. But other than that, it really wasn't that bad. I mean, you got wrapped up in that shit and yeah. like that that's one thing I that amazes me with y'all when y'all actually get like wrapped up and bundled up in the shit and then like a lot of them like necro and you know john they just rip their hair out of it and i think i've seen you do it i'm like what how do y'all just rip y'all fucking hair out i know that's more painful it, i mean it is but we got to get the fuck out one way or another. You know, what's the point in waiting, you know? Uh, yeah. Hell, if, you, if you go back and watch with uh, me and Masada, uh, he, you know, kind of rips me over him. When I go to pick him up, he snatches and dra arm drags me over into the barbed wire ropes at our match at GCW. And my whole, lo my whole body slides outside the ring. And the barbed wire is the only thing that was holding me up. It was the barbs had buried into my back and everything, and that's what was holding me. I was Jesus. literally just hanging off the side of the, the ring by barbs. Jesus. Being a wrestler, what's it like when you take time off? Uh, it's bittersweet, man, to be honest. Uh, taking time away because, you know, you you get a chance to rest, relax, you're not stressing, you know, the next booking. You're not stressing, you know, who who you're going to be working with or anything of that sort. Uh, you get to just kind of enjoy life at that moment. But at the same time, you know, you know, I can't speak for all, but for myself, I thrive off of being in the ring. You know, it, I enjoy it so much. And I know most of us out there do. So when you're away from it, you know, it's our, you, you constantly have that itch. You know, you, you want to be back in there and you want to do something, but at the same time, you're beat up, you're tired. You know, so like for me, when I took the last like couple years off, you know, it, like I really enjoyed it, but at the same time, I was just, I almost felt lost because I didn't know what to do with myself a lot of the times. And I just craved that, that energy to be back in the ring. I understand that. Considering you went through a bed of death, what do you think about it? Uh, it really ain't that bad. I mean, it's not. It, it was like any other day at the office being slammed into barbed wire. <laughs> I mean, like, I would think that them beds of death fucking are furious. I think that, you know, them, them things look, look like they can fucking hurt. So, yeah. Can we ask? Can we ask your hobbies out of the ring? Uh, besides staying in the gym and everything, uh, I love to draw. I love to paint stuff like that. Oh, uh, I've actually sold a lot of my artwork over the years. Uh, I ride my motorcycle, you know, and things like that. I mean. So, whether, you know, I'm at peace and calm, you know, painting and drawing, but or, you know, I'm pushing my limits on the bike, you know, with the adrenaline. You know, one way or another, I'm going to be, you know, doing something, whether I'm going to put myself at peace, you know, just enjoying what I do. 
Yeah, I was saying that uh, you ride, but I wasn't going to ask you because I didn't know if that was like too personal or whatever. But yeah, no. I've seen that you ride. I was like, this big man on a motorcycle? Oh, shit. That's a sight to see. Uh, I noticed in some of your matches uh, that you put stuff in your gauges when you come to the ring. How did that come about? I think it's cool. Uh, I used to work for one of the number one haunted attractions. In the U.S., it was known. It's uh, still here in North Alabama. It's called Arx Mortis. Uh, I used to be the, uh, I, I was the hillbilly roamer. And so I would uh, roam throughout the woods of the haunt. And uh, I, one day I, I was messing with one of the buildings and there was these uh, fox traps hanging on the wall. And it was just used for decor, but. I, I just saw them and I liked them. And so I was messing around with people and I found some uh, old carabiners sitting around and I just, I latched them on the carabiners so I could keep them together. Well, I don't know what, I don't even remember what started it, but for some reason I just up and decided I just clipped them into my ears and just let them drag. And, uh, you know, then it just became a thing. They they became my two best friends working at the haunt. I had dingle and dangle, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was it was pretty entertaining there for a long time. So, can we ask why you wasn't at Carnage Cup twelve? Uh, well, I had a knee replacement in twenty twenty one. So, I mean, I was, I've been down with injury for that. Like, I, I mean, I could barely stand up to walk. Like, it, the I had zero cartilage in my knee. It was completely gone. So, it was almost unbearable. So, I was just having to deal with it. And I didn't feel it was fair to the fans or anybody else to be going out there and half-assing anything, knowing what I'm capable of. That's understandable. Yes, sir. I think you answered it earlier, but what was it like when being in the IWA Mid South King of the Death matches? Uh, well, there again, it was kind of like me getting to go up to GCW or yeah, GCW. It was uh that that was one of the first things I got to do, and uh, it initially, you know, it, it was definitely it was an honor because. There again, people wanted to shit on everybody out of the Deep South area. You know, they had pretty much got where they didn't want to give anybody an opportunity. And uh, luckily at the time, you know, I'd gotten to work with Corp. And uh, Corp went back up north to all these other promotions and was like, dude, you got to see this kid. And uh, next thing you know, he put my name out there a little bit. And I had an opportunity to go up there and show out a little bit more. And it just kind of skyrocketed from there. So, I mean, regardless of everything, you know, yeah, I wouldn't go back now, but uh, I still wouldn't go back and erase that opportunity. So, if you don't mind me asking, what made you split your tongue? I love body modification. I always have, even as a little kid. Um, I enjoy being different, you know, so whether it's tattoos, piercings, uh, I've done uh, body suspension and things like that. I enjoy pushing my body past the normal limits just to see what I'm capable of kind of deal. Uh, I actually do plan on later on having like the silicone implants, the designs. I'm going to have rib cages implanted across my biceps. That's fucking dope. So, um, I, what you uh, being into body modifications, have you ever thought about like, I don't know, like when Zendik done, done it, hung himself with the meat hooks. Uh, that's what I was saying. I've done body suspension. That's what that's. Yeah, called. that's what I was uh, meant that. Actually, actually, John had talked with me about doing that actual spot, but uh, it it just kind of seemed to it didn't really fit, you know, as far as what all was going on at the time and. Uh, uh, I was dealing with some other issues, so I kind of wasn't willing to uh, kind of put myself in that position right then and there. So I, I chose to decline, and that's when uh, Slack actually ended up doing it. So I, I'm I'm into body suspensions and shit, but when Zendik done it, it blows my mind. You know, like 
I think it's cool, not something that I'm into. Excuse me, I get into other people's body modifications and body suspensions. Me, I'm not really into it. Um, I got, well, I had my ears pierced, but I feel like I was probably close. And then I have one tattoo. I'm wanting to get more tattoos. I'm more into tattoos than I am piercings or yeah. body modifications. Um, which we, we've done, asked and talked about it. After Carnage Cup 13 and you come off the U-Haul, did you injure or break anything? Yeah, I fractured my L1 and L2. Um, as you, if you watch the video, of course, you know, I couldn't even hardly stand up initially. I had to crawl to be able to get the pin. Um, I got to the back, was trying to stand up. I couldn't hardly stand up. It was killing me. My whole lower back was. And then, uh, I got in the car, went to the hotel room because initially I had, uh, everything was planned. I was supposed to have defended the title the next day. And I woke up the next morning, and I couldn't even sit up in the bed. Like, I could not sit up at all. Once I was down, that was it. So it, it was pretty gnarly. I knew something bad was going on, but I didn't know just how bad. And so I had to hit up Kevin. I was like, look, I know I'm supposed to be there, brother, but uh, I got to go to the hospital. Like, this ain't normal. And that's when they told me I had fractured my L1 and L2. So did you go through any, like, which you, you, knowing you, no offense, but you don't go through physical therapy, but did you do anything to, like, fix it? or? Uh, they told me to take it easy for the first several weeks, to which I did. Uh, but after, you know, they told me I could start doing some, some stretching and so on and so forth, I started doing that, just kind of stretching my back back out. And then at four weeks, uh, I started back in the gym and just kind of doing some real light uh, lifting. And then by week five, I was starting to pick back up with a lot more. And then by week six and seven, I pretty much like I was back to just like my normal lower back pain that I'll, I've dealt with for a long time anyways due to uh, me already having two bulging discs. So it, it was kind of back to normal. And when I went back to the doctor, they said everything had been healed up. So I was kind of fortunate because had it got up into my L3 and L4, I could have, you know, they would have probably bedridden me for potentially, you know, the possibility of it breaking through and me being paralyzed. Being paralyzed. So. so this is uh, the final question. And it comes from one of your fans on Facebook. And okay. it goes – Ask him his thoughts on IWA Deep South and Kevin, his plans in coming out from Tennessee and Alabama, please. Uh, I mean, as far as his plans traveling out of Alabama, I mean, I think that's some of the best things that can be done. Uh, the only uh, references that I would try to give to Kevin, to which me and him have talked about this, is I do wish that we could find more uh, enclosures for events instead of doing them necessarily out in fields and yes. uh, things of that sort. Uh, just because it's, you know, the more professional outlook of things, you know, more people tend to be attracted to come to places when it's, you know, enclosed, you know, People don't want to buy tickets to fly somewhere and not be sure if it's going to pour down rain and ruin the event, you know? I'm so, sure. uh, you know, things like that. But uh, other than that, I mean, I think Kevin, you know, he's always put a lot of effort and, and uh, he's definitely doing things, you know, being able to get it on XPW channel. And I think it'll go further, you know, hopefully, uh, like I said, I've talked with him several times. He hits me up whenever he's got some ideas of some things he wants to do, and I try to give him some input. So uh, hopefully over time it will all kind of play its course and, and IWA Deep South can kind of build its way back up. Um, personally, I think Deep South needs to stick to what we do best, and that, that's going out there and still in the show, you know, being whether it's going over the top with some of the brutality or keep it, keeping it technical. Uh, the my opinions, whether it comes to like the soft core stuff, you know that he's put on. Kevin, I love you, brother, but it, it don't sell. I mean, I'll be honest with you; it might work for some kids and all, but 
uh, in the reality of things, IWA Deep South was built on violence. And I think, you know, the best way to build it is to focus on what we do best, you know, and, and that's build it from that and, and continue to drive it forward. You know, you can't, the, the back and forth scenarios, uh, you know, and, and like I said, it's no disrespect. I mean, he, he's gotten a lot of fans with it. You know, he's done some big events with it. But at the same time, you know, I would much rather see IWA Deep South put on a uh, just a straight, uh, you know, tough, you know, tough man kind of situation, whether it then do softcore, you know, go out there, no weapons, no nothing, just go out there and and have a, a wrestling tournament. You know, the most technical and over the top kind of stuff, you know. Take it back old school when it comes to that. If you want to do something that's not just built on blood and guts, you know, uh, but that's what we're known for. You know, yeah. IWA Deep South is known for the violence. You know, uh, people fell in love with it for that reason. Don't throw away your your uh, base fans, you know, for something just because of uh, some people not being a fan of it. You know, there there's more than enough deathmatch fans out there, and if you build and thrive on it and you build it up, you know, make it as professional and everything else. I mean, we see it already with GCW. You know, that shows one of the biggest shows in the nation, in the world, and it's built on violence. You know, it can be done. So, uh, like I said, Kevin, he knows I got all the respect in the world for him. And uh, he knows I'm going to go out there and bust my ass for him. But that's just my opinion. You know, he does what he wants. And uh, just hopefully uh, in time, whether it's he sticks with that or, or goes back, you know, to where where the home base is, you know, uh, hopefully it'll, it'll grow out from there. I'd love to get deep south down here in Kentucky, but the, we ain't allowed to have no blood matches, no – death matches, nothing like that. It's only allowed to be technical. And if, like, NWA comes down and there's, like, a simple nosebleed, the match has to immediately quit or the yeah. promoter will get fined. And I'm like, fuck you, Jim Cornette, because he was one of the ones That's, that, that, that... Honestly, it's the exact same in Alabama right now. With the Alabama Athletic Commission, it's the same thing. We're not supposed to. We do the shit anyways, but we're not supposed to. <laughs> hey, it's IWA Deep South. What do you expect? Hey, well, hey, look, I've been an outlaw my whole life, whether I'm in the ring, on the bike, you know, living my general life. I do shit that uh, I've been told I'm not supposed to do my whole life. It's not going to change who I am now. You tell me I can't bleed, I'll bleed right over the top of you and laugh in your face. That don't matter. I'd love to see him smack the fucking dog shit straight out of Jim Cornette. I'm sorry. <laughs> look, I mean, I know Jim. I know Jim hates on a lot of deathmatch wrestling, and I get it. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people don't care for that. But in reality, the man knows wrestling. He knows – I mean, he's old school. He knows what he's talking about. You know, he, like you said, you know, it's one thing to go out there and beat the shit out of each other with weapons as it is to go out there and, and entertain, you know, showing skill and talent, you know, yeah, you, you're tough as shit to go out there and beat the shit out of you. But that's where I like to throw in the technicalities, you know, doing technical wrestling and everything. Because I like to show it's not just built on violence, just brawling and blood. I want to be able to go out there and show that, you know, yeah, I can do this, but guess what? I can fucking wrestle too. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, he's got his opinion. A lot of people don't care for it, but I respect the man and what he's done for the business. And I respect his opinion. You know, it, it just it is what it is. Yes, sir. Well, this is your boy Skinny Moose, and I'm out. I'll take it easy. And I'm out. Have a scar, baby. Live life. That's your boy Brad Woods.